A teacher walked into the classroom one morning, and she asked a little boy, If you had five dollars, and you asked your father for another five dollars, how much would you have? The boy answered, Five dollars. The teacher asked again, It seems you did not get me well. I said, if you have five dollars and your father, you decide to ask your father to give you another five dollars, how much would you have? And the boy emphatically said, five dollars, of course. The teacher shook her head and said, you don't know your maths at all. And the little boy in turn shook his head and said, you don't know my father at all. When a father decides to ask his teenage son the question, Who is in charge here? You have to know that there is trouble. Or when a teacher in the classroom decides to ask the students, Who is in charge in this class? It means there is trouble. And so whenever the one who is obviously in charge comes up with a question, Who is in charge here? We can only guess right that it is no longer a question but a reminder to the subordinate that the one who is speaking is the one who is in charge. The parable in today's gospel passage is meant to answer the question, who is in charge here? You remember how it all began? It began with the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and his cleansing of the temple that had been turned into a den of robbers, a place of doing wrong businesses. It was after chasing out those who were turning the temple into a place of businesses that were not supposed to be that the chief priests and the elders of the people came to question the authority of Jesus. And in answer to that, Jesus gave three consecutive parables. One of them we encountered last Sunday, the parable of the two sons. One was asked to go and carry out an errand for the father. He said no, he did yes. The other said yes and did no. Today we encounter the second parable and next Sunday we'll encounter the third parable, all meant to answer the question, who is in charge here? In today's parable, the landlord who stands for God is the one in charge as demonstrated in his ownership of the land and also in his putting the vineyard in proper shape before leasing it out. The question of who is in charge came up when it was time for the harvest. He sent his servants to collect his produce, but the tenants thought that they were the ones in charge, and so they maltreated the servants by beating one, stoning one, and killing one. They gave the same treatment to another set of servants, and finally, when the landowner sent his son, the tenants made known their motive in the words, this is the heir, come let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. Through these words, it became very evident that the servants, or rather the tenants, wanted to take over the ownership of the land. But you remember what G.K. Chesterton said. He wrote that a man walking comes to the edge of the cliff and keeps walking. He will not break the law of gravity. He will only prove it. And so all the efforts of the tenants to change the ownership of the land, ended up proving the right of the landowner and making themselves to lose even the little that they had. In the first instance, the parable was meant to express the relationship between God and the people of Israel. The landowner stands for God, and the tenant stands for the chief priests and the elders of the people. The servants stand for the prophets, and the Son stands for Jesus Christ. And as the responsorial psalm already clarified, 
the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. And so God, out of love, chose Israel as a special people, and he entrusted them to the care of the chief priests and the elders of the people. When God sent prophets to deliver his message and to ensure that they were yielding fruits, they maltreated the prophets. Eventually, he sent his son Jesus, who they were already planning to kill. And so Jesus told this parable to let the chief priests and the elders of the people recognize themselves and what they were doing. Just like last Sunday, his listeners did not recognize themselves in the parable. And so they were very quick in passing judgment on themselves. Jesus then took it from there to inform them that since they failed to recognize who was in charge, the kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to a people that will produce its fruits. And so, my dearly beloved Christ, how is this parable relevant to us today? We have all received life from God as a special gift on trust. And it is our responsibility to live our life in a way that it bears good fruit that we can present to God at the end of our sojourn here on earth. The life that God has given to us is the vineyard he has given to us to take care of. The landowner's preparation of the vineyard before leasing it out tells us something about God. It shows that God, before entrusting a responsibility to us, makes provision for all that we will need in carrying out the responsibility. And that means that God's will does not take us to where God's grace cannot take care of us. And so, enough of all the excuses that we give. Oh, I would have done better if I were to be in so and so place. I would have done better if I were to be in a particular situation. Wherever the will of God finds us, his grace provides all that we need. When he leads it out, he went away. This shows God's trust in us. God does not police us or micromanage our lives when he gives us responsibilities. He also sent out a second set of servants. It shows how patient God can be with us. If we fail in the first instance, he gives us another opportunity. However, when he sent his son, it was meant to show that there is also the last chance, and that is when judgment will be passed. The workers in the vineyard did not want to recognize the owner of the vineyard as being in charge, and so they lost what they had. In the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve got into trouble as soon as they started questioning the fact that God was in charge. And so the serpent deceived them that by eating of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, they will be in charge. Also, the first book of Samuel, chapter 13, beginning from verse 5, tells us of how King Saul, the first king of Israel, lost his position because he wanted to be in charge where he was obviously not in charge. The opportunities we have today come from the hard works of others. That we have the freedom of worship today is because some others sacrifice their lives for us to have it. Unfortunately, sometimes the whole claim of entitlement seems to be more by those who did not work for what they are benefiting from. Since we have received all that we have and trust, we must use them for the good of all, bearing in mind that we are not the land owner. Whatever talent you have today has been given to you on trust. We begin to get into trouble when we decide to live our lives based on our own rules rather than the rules of the one who gave us the life. And so, such attitudes as, I can do whatever I like with my life. I can do whatever I like with my body, with my talent, with my husband, with my wife, with my sibling, with my friend. I can treat the earth any way I like. will only get us into trouble. 
That is why every morning when I wake up, I tell myself, Father Emmanuel, you are not in charge. And then I say, yes, Father, I know. And before I go to bed, I remind myself again, Father Emmanuel, you were not in charge. And I say, yes, Father, I knew. So, my dearly beloved in Christ, I remind you of the same, that you are not in charge.